You know, without something to recharge it, that battery is just a paperweight. Hello everybody, I am Nick the Naval Architect. A major allure behind electric propulsion is the ability to recharge the batteries from multiple sources. And that leads to vastly extended range. We're thinking about renewable energy utilization now. But this isn't easy. Most electric yachts are going to require multiple charging sources. So how to make them all work together? Today, I'm going to review the methods of charging on electric yachts and how to combine them. And a brief acknowledgement before we get going, many thanks to Jeff Cote from Pacific Yacht Systems. I used a lot of his advice and background knowledge for forming these presentations. I highly recommend you check out his YouTube channel and his website. And just a quick disclaimer here, I am not an electrical engineer by trade, I'm a naval architect, which means that I know many of the right questions to ask for electric systems but don't necessarily have all of the answers. So absolutely use these videos as a starting point, but definitely consult with a marine electrician or an electrical engineer before embarking on your own projects. When you're recharging that massive battery bank, go straight to the source. Direct current chargers. This is also just called a battery charger. And many electric yachts will include multiple DC sources for charging. You'll have solar panels, an engine alternator, a methanol fuel cell, regeneration from the propulsion motor, all of these can be feeding in. So how are you going to combine them? Generally, each source is going to include its own battery charger. The battery charger then takes that raw output from your charging source and controls it to provide a tempered current flow into the battery. The current flowing into your battery, that controls the rate of recharge. And we want to slow that down as the battery starts to get full. This is why you'll hear people talk about charging profiles with different stages in them. And the biggest problem is that recharging heats up the battery. Too much heat and we damage the battery. And those profiles have to be customized to your specific battery chemistry. Right, so we've laid out the problem. Charging too fast makes batteries go boom. So combining multiple chargers sounds like a terrible idea, right? Nope. As a general principle, there's nothing wrong with connecting all of these battery chargers to the same point, all of them going straight into the battery. Chargers work by sensing the voltage at the battery. As the battery recharges up to full, the voltage that that battery puts out increases slightly. So a nominal 12 volt battery may actually generate 13 to 13.6 volts when it's fully charged there's a difference in the voltage output between full charge and empty batteries. And this is how the charger tracks the state of the battery. But it also means that to put power into the battery, the charger needs to supply that full voltage, or even slightly higher. Well, that works perfectly fine with one charger. But let's play this out with two battery chargers going into one battery. That's an example on your screen. So charger one reads the battery voltage as 12.5 volts. It starts recharging the battery, supplying a voltage of 14.2 volts. Now that 14.2, that's coming from the charger, not from the battery. So it's feeding power into the battery. But here's the catch. The voltage now reads as 14.2 everywhere on that circuit. Put a multimeter on there, you're gonna see 14.2 volts all along that circuit. And this is bad news for charger number two. So charger two came into the game a little late. Now it reads 14.2 volts as well, thinking that that's the battery voltage. It doesn't know that 14.2 volts is actually coming from the other charger. So charger two thinks, well, 14.2, that's a full battery. I don't need to do anything, and it turns off. This method of coordination means that multiple chargers are not going to overload the battery. You can happily connect dozens of chargers and only one is going to turn on at any given time. But that's also a problem for high capacity systems like we would use in electric propulsion. Sometimes we want more than one charger. If we're trying to get a reasonable recharge for those massive batteries, well, generally one charger is not going to be enough. 
we need more current than just one charger can muster. That's where smart battery chargers come in. They work in parallel, all of them feeding in at the same time. So how do they do this? The key is communication. Rather than just sensing the voltage at the battery, these chargers communicate directly with each other. Normally, one charger is going to become the master. It's going to have a charge profile that specifies the current limits for each stage in the charge cycle. That master charger then coordinates with all the others, and it ensures that the combined total stays within that charge profile. Now, how exactly do they coordinate? The, the specifics usually depend on the manufacturer. And that should tell you something, that you're going to probably be tied to one manufacturer for your battery chargers. They'll probably even need to be from the same series of products within that manufacturer. So you're signing up for a pretty large commitment here. Carefully select your manufacturer, since you might be buying a lot of charging equipment from them. Now for a special case. When charging lithium ion batteries, you want to be especially cautious. Ensure that your battery charger is programmed with a profile for lithium ion batteries. Because if a lithium battery gets too hot, that can lead to fire. No joke. Temperature monitoring becomes critical. Many of these lithium chargers will have a temperature sensor right on the battery itself. Because with lithium, the wrong settings mean more than just a damaged battery they mean a damaged vessel. The second note of caution is engine alternators. Be sure that any engine alternator is designed for lithium ion batteries. And this is because the lithium batteries often come with internal circuitry to protect the battery. You can't see this, it's built right into the battery casing. And during the recharge cycle, if the battery gets too hot, that internal circuit is going to completely disconnect the battery. This is to protect the battery from turning into a fireball. And this is just like flipping a switch, internal to the battery. Suddenly, the engine alternators are disconnected with no battery to feed into. Alternators really don't like it when they suddenly lose the battery. It tends to damage or destroy the alternator. So be sure that your alternator is protected against this if you're recharging a lithium ion battery. Now let's talk about diesel generators. These are great for long-term storage of energy, it's a very reliable way to recharge your batteries. Yes, they do consume diesel fuel, which definitely has some negative environmental impacts. But batteries just can't compete with the energy density of diesel fuel. Even when you're accounting for the weight and the size of the generator, diesel fuel still holds much more energy in a much smaller space than any equivalent battery. That's what the graph on your screen is showing. This is comparing the weight required to store energy in batteries, that black line, versus the same equivalent energy in diesel fuel, the blue line. And you'll see that once we start storing very large amounts of energy, there's just no comparison. The diesel fuel is a mere fraction of the weight of a battery. So go out and buy a DC generator, right? I mean, I just extolled the simplicity of DC charging. A massive DC generator could supply huge quantities of power could quickly recharge those batteries, right? <sighs> Not so easy. Here we suffer from supply limits. Most large generators are AC supply, alternating current. They were built for a traditional yacht market, where the largest loads are coming from the AC side. These are things like your refrigeration, your air conditioning, all of those big ticket items. So most likely you're going to need to buy an AC generator and then convert that into DC power just for your battery charging. This is normally where people start to talk about inverters. A standard yacht comes with an inverter and it acts as a bridge between the AC and the DC side of your electric systems. It can go either way, converting AC to DC or DC to AC power. So it seems very normal that you're going to connect that generator with an inverter. Well, maybe not. This depends on the cost. Remember that you need to convert a huge amount of power to supply that electric propulsion. Large power means large, expensive equipment. You can buy simple battery chargers that hook up to that AC generator. All they do is go from AC power to DC battery charging. They don't go back and forth like an inverter. But simple is good. 
simple battery chargers can cost less than that fancy inverter. So there's definitely some opportunity here to save money by running the generator through a dedicated battery charger and then buying a smaller inverter to handle your regular hotel loads. Okay, now we're switching over to the AC side, alternating current. I've just finished talking about how you combine all these sources for DC charging. Now you would imagine I'm next going to talk about combining AC sources. Well, that's not as simple actually. In fact, there's this myth that ABYC standards don't even allow boats to combine AC charging sources. Verboten, not allowed. And so you don't really have many choices for AC charging on your ship because it will only be picking one out of the options. You know, that just seems like a major problem on an electric yacht where we need lots of charging capabilities. Let me assure you that AC charging is absolutely allowed. You can absolutely combine sources. To do AC charging, we need to tackle the problem of synchronization. Your AC power works with your electrons moving back and forth in the wires. They travel in both directions, working in a rhythm. That rhythm is the frequency of the power, normally 60 hertz here in North America. When you add in a new AC source, you can't just randomly drop it in. It needs to match the rhythm of the power so that everything is working in a coordinated fashion. And that matching requires three major elements. We have to match the voltage of the current system, we have to match the frequency, and we have to match the phase angle of the current system. All of these elements need to match up within a close tolerance before you can actually flip the switch to connect your two AC sources together. We do this on the larger commercial ships all the time. It takes specialized equipment to synchronize your sources. And that's why ABYC is not going to let you just throw a switch and hook the wires together from different AC sources. But it's right there in the standards that if you add synchronizing equipment as a bridge between the two AC sources, well, that's perfectly fine for combining them. In the big commercial ships, this is a whole part of their training. They teach the engineers how to manually synchronize the generators, and it takes a lot to learn. Thankfully, you don't need to learn the process of manually synchronizing your generators. We now have the equipment to automatically synchronize AC sources. In fact, you may already have an AC synchronizer on your ship. Some modern inverters will allow parallel operation of shore power and an AC generator. So how does the inverter combine these? Well, it has an internal synchronizer. So the takeaway from this is that multiple AC sources are very possible if you have synchronization. Electric power entices us. It's got that flexibility and adaptability. It's really nice that way. And this extends to our charging sources as well. We gain the ability to recharge our batteries from nearly any source. You can have lots of different options all flowing into the same battery. When properly wired with the correct equipment, this is nearly a flawless process. It happens automatically, a silent symphony of synchronized equipment. Just take the time to ensure that you buy the right equipment. Because these systems are getting more complicated. That's the real innovation we're seeing now, is rather than just creating one piece of equipment that does all the jobs poorly, instead we're allowing lots of individual pieces of equipment that are focused on doing one job really well, and now it's the system design that has the job of coordinating between all of those and making sure that they play nicely together. Added complexity gets you more performance, but it really emphasizes the need to double check everything and make sure that you design the overall system correctly. Thanks very much. I am Nick the Naval Architect. Sorry everybody, no kitschy catchphrase today. Just some simple straight talk. Engineering is not about the ship. It's about what do you want to do with that ship. The future is focused on performance-based design. How are we going to use engineering solutions to turn this ship into an asset for your business goals? That is what DMS achieves. Engineered solutions for improved business performance in the marine field. If that sounds interesting to you, give us a call and let's see what we can do.